Peter Manuel was a clever, cunning psychopath. He's also someone who's been dubbed Scotland's first serial killer. Everyone described Peter Manuel as a cold-eyed killer. Peter Manuel was a brutal man who killed many people, and he paid the ultimate price for that. Ask anyone here in Glasgow who Peter Manuel was, and they will doubtless reply, the devil incarnate. During the 1950s, he brought fear to the streets of Scotland. A ruthless serial killer who confessed to nine murders, but is suspected of many more. Now, more than 50 years on, I want to find out why the name Manuel will still send shivers down the spines of those old enough to remember his reign of terror. Nobody should die that way. I've never seen anything that horrific. One of the duties of a pathologist is to determine the cause of death. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. I'm Fred Dynage, and I'm investigating some of Britain's most infamous murderers. I want to find out what turned them into killers and discover why they think they can get away with it. Peter Anthony Manuel was the archetype of a psychopath, a cold, heartless killer with no emotion for his actions. He was born in New York in 1927. His parents had left Scotland for a new life in America. Peter was the middle child with an elder brother and younger sister. The family struggled during the Wall Street crash and returned to Scotland in 1932. Manuel was just five. Someone who studied Peter Manuel in depth is Malcolm McLeod, an author with a passion for historical crime. So he arrives back in Scotland with a very different accent, a different background, different knowledge, different education system, and I think he finds life very difficult. He's displaced, he's thrown into a different schooling system, and he seems to make heavy weather of it. From the age of 10, Manuel began to get into trouble. His broad American accent and his small stature isolated him from the other children. He became a loner. By the time he's 11, he's already in trouble. He breaks into the offertory box of the church, which is next to his school. He then commits a large number of other petty crimes, breaking and entering, stealing people's wallets. He becomes locally notorious as a bad wee boy. Manuel started his life of crime at a very early age, lured by the easy pickings of money and valuables. But there was another side of Manuel developing, a dark, sadistic side. Leading criminologist Professor David Wilson has studied how certain traits developed in early childhood can lead to a very dangerous adult. He gets into trouble fairly early on in his life, doesn't he? Manuel is somebody who loves breaking and entering. He loves going into people's homes, breaking into their houses. He loves entering private spaces that don't belong to him and in some way despoiling that private space. Often he will reveal that when he was alone or when he was walking the, the fields near where they were living in Uddingston, he would attack animals with a knife. He would use a knife on sheep or on horses or on cattle. But equally, he's completely devoted as he's growing up to the family Alsatian dog called Rusty. So we're beginning to see a picture here in Manuel's childhood of issues that are going to reappear as he becomes an adult. The Manuel family moved again, this time to Coventry, where Manuel gained a place at a grammar school. Instances of his odd behavior soon surfaced. When Manuel's at school, 
a teacher discovered that he had drawn a really pornographic cartoon. And the teacher asked Manuel, did you draw this? And what was interesting was that Manuel steadfastly refused to show any remorse in relation to what he had drawn. And that's a, a true example of the psychopath in the making. Psychopaths find it very difficult to accept that they've done something that's wrong. In October 1939, after a string of break-ins, 12-year-old Manuel was sent to a correctional facility. His big brother James had already been in trouble and had also been sent to an approved school. There's two things about him in the approved schools. One is he runs away all the time. He's continually escaping, and while he's free, he commits other crimes, stealing bicycles, breaking into houses. There are a number of times when he actually assaults people. He breaks into one house. He's age 14. He's carrying an ax with him. The woman who is woken by him has a nervous breakdown. He breaks into another house, and a woman who's asleep wakes up to find he's battering her around the head with a hammer. We've got pictures growing up here of a very, very disturbed young man, which probably comes to a crescendo when he's 15, again in approved school. He attacks one of the wives of one of his teachers with a stick, drags her into a forest, removes her undergarments, but isn't able to um, penetrate her. He, he just simply removes her undergarments, but doesn't rape her. And I think there's something there, Fred, about the sense in which he gets his sexual thrills from simply harming, hurting women that he encounters. A year after the attack at the age of 16, having learned nothing from the approved schools, Manuel was sent to a Borstal. The escapes and housebreakings continued. The Borstal could only hold him until he reached 18, and in March 1945, he was released. The war's still going on. He gets his call-up papers, but he is, in fact, a US citizen. He was born there. So he doesn't serve in the army. He takes a few laboring jobs. It's almost a mini crime wave in his area. He breaks into houses at night, maybe two or three at a night. He steals whatever he can lay his hands on. As Manuel's violent sexual appetite grew, so did his desire to act upon his urges. In the spring of 1946, the Uddingston area of Glasgow was hit with a string of sexually motivated attacks. Manuel is simply attacking and harming women, and when they are vulnerable, when he has power over them, he doesn't seem to be able to achieve erection. He doesn't seem to be able to penetrate his victims, but in relation to the third woman that he attacks, he rapes her against a wall. He then is arrested, charged, tried, and convicted for that rape, and that leads to his prison sentence. On the 25th of June, 1946, the jury took just 15 minutes to convict Manuel of rape. He was sentenced to eight years in Glasgow's Barlini prison. It would be his first time inside. Would it tame his violent ways? And he eventually ends up in Peterhead prison, which is the hardest, toughest place in Scotland for prisoners. He gets beaten up by the warders at some point. He is a continuous nuisance all the way through his time. He's involved in mutinies, smashing things. Because he misbehaves so violently and constantly, they send him for a psychiatric examination to Aberdeen. And the psychiatrist there, he said, I've examined this man, and from all the records I can see from when he was young, he's an aggressive psychopath. The chief warder at Peterhead has a much simpler thing on it. He says, this is one of the worst people we've ever had here. The only way we can handle him is when he's locked up on his own. When Manuel was released from prison, he returned to live with his family. The change in him was noticeable. He'd studied law and broadened his vocabulary, but it wasn't long before Manuel returned to his evil ways. On the 30th of July, 1955, Mary McLaughlin became his next victim. 
She is going home at night after a dance, I think, and she's attacked from behind by a man who drags her into a field with a knife and threatens to cut her throat. He then gropes her and she fears she's going to be raped. And suddenly all this aggression and horror fades away. He just stops, he changes completely. And it has been suggested that he's reached a sexual climax and therefore, you know, he stops. Mary sees her attacker. She recognizes him and Manuel is identified. Mary McLaughlin very bravely also talks her way out of that particular set of circumstances and is able to persuade Manuel to let her go and saying that she won't go to the police. Of course, she does go to the police. She draws attention to the fact she knows Peter Manuel. Manuel was arrested and charged for attempted rape. His previous encounters with the law had given him an arrogant confidence and he decided to represent himself in court. Now, when he comes to trial, he's going to defend himself. And this is very important. This is Manuel QC, Manuel the great lawyer. His story is that she'd made all this up. They'd actually been boyfriend, girlfriend, and she was angry at him, so she'd made up this story of his attack on her, and it was all lies. The jury can't make up its mind and produces a decision which is unique to Scottish law, saying that the case against Manuel is not proven. Now, that doesn't mean he's guilty or not guilty. It's just simply that the jury didn't believe the prosecution had made a good enough case. And I think that case is also very important in relation to uh, Manuel's development as uh, an offender because he believes that by the gift of the gab he can talk his way out of some of these really uh, serious charges that are brought against him. On the 2nd of January 1956, 28-year-old Manuel struck again. This time his actions would have deadly consequences. I'm Fred Dynage, and I'm looking into the case of Scotland's most notorious serial killer, Peter Manuel. In January 1956, at the age of 28, Peter Manuel's horrific acts of violence were escalating. So far, he'd attacked five women and raped another, along with a string of house break-ins and thefts. Manuel's sense of invincibility grew and so did his deadly desires. He and his father were working in East Kilbride as gas main laborers, fitting gas mains to the new houses that had been built there. Anne Neelands has arranged to meet someone that she's met at a dance on 2nd of January. The guy she's met, forgotten about this, doesn't turn up. So she goes to East Kilbride, and after that, all track of her is lost. The next day, Anne Neelan's body is discovered on a golf course at East Kilbride. She'd been the victim of a brutal sexual attack. It's clear she ran fleeing from her pursuers across open ground onto the golf course. She'd lost a shoe. She'd been fought her way through or over barbed wire fencing, but she's been chased and caught. Her knickers are removed by the time they find the body and she's been battered around the head. I mean, horribly battered. There's blood and bone and flesh eight, 10, 12 feet away, splashed from this wound. The police launched a widespread investigation. One policeman noticed scratches on Manuel's face. He was questioned, but his father provided him with an alibi, clearing him of any wrongdoing. The trail of Anne Neelan's killer had grown cold. The police had no leads and no evidence. Manuel's sexual violence had escalated into murder. He'd escaped justice and was now free to terrorise Scotland. One gets the impression that he's sexually aroused only with women in, in ways which are not normal. He's got a paraphilia. He, uh, for example, likes hurting women. A lot of his crimes, even when he's a teenager, are about exposing women's genitals, but he never penetrates. He simply wants to 
hurt the woman mm. that he's managed to get access to, whether he gets access to them from abducting them or through breaking and entering. By September 1955, Manuel had moved his operation to Burnside, a middle-class suburb of Glasgow. He'd become more cold and detached with no fear of being caught and no thoughts of remorse for his horrific actions. On the 9th of September, 1956, William Watt left to go on a fishing trip to Argyle, leaving his wife, daughter and sister-in-law alone in the house. Margaret, her sister Marion, and the daughter Vivian are discovered by the, the cleaner who has an arrangement with Mrs. Watt that she would go to the back door, which would be left open. On the day in question, the back door is closed. Uh, the cleaner moves to the front of the house, notices that there's glass missing in the door, and therefore asks the postman to see if they could break in to discover what's actually happened. When the cleaner makes her way upstairs, she discovers an horrendous scene. Margaret and her sister Marion were lying in bed with their nightclothes torn. They'd both been shot in the head. Vivian, the daughter, lay next door in her room. She'd also been shot. Vivian, the young daughter, the 17-year-old, seems to have put up a struggle. And it looks like she's been hit, maybe tortured, maybe taunted before being shot. The daughter is still alive at that point, barely alive. They hear her make sort of coughing, spluttering noises and she dies. Margaret Watt's undergarments, her pajamas had been pulled down, again to reveal her genitals. And in a separate room is Vivian Watt. Clearly, he had spent more time with Vivian Watt. There was a gunshot wound to um, Vivian's head, and again, there were bruising on her genital area, but no penetration. The west of Scotland went into near panic as the news of the mass murder spread quickly. The police were under pressure to find the culprit. Journalist Russell Galbraith remembers covering the story for the Glasgow Evening News. Well, the Watts is an amazing story. The police and the Crown determined that William Watt, the husband, was the guilty party. The police established that a police driver could get from the Watts house to the hotel where he stayed faster than Watts said it took him. And on that, they, they built a case. That, and it should be said, uh, a ferryman, I think, on the Renfrew ferry from memory, the a ferryman said that he had seen a man who answered Watts' description with a black dog and he had a big black Labrador called Queenie, I think, that uh, he had seen them on the ferry. The police arrested Watt. He's driven down from where he's on his fishing holiday. At one point, the Argyleshire police swap him into a Lanarkshire police car for the rest of the journey. One of the policemen in the, that car is convinced what is not showing enough remorse or worry or horror or fear about this terrible crime. He begins to think what has done it. William Watt was arrested and charged with the murder of his family. As the news travelled, relief spread across Glasgow. There was no psycho killer on the loose. Well, they were right, but for the wrong reasons. Because Watt's lawyer began receiving cryptic messages from an inmate at Barlini Prison who seemed to have inside information on the horrific murders. An amazing coincidence, because after the Watts had been murdered, Manuel was picked up for a burglary on a local colliery. So he's on remand in Barlini Prison too. Manuel is clearly upset that Mr. Watt is getting the attention for the murders that he, Manuel, has committed. Manuel explained details of the house and the locale and indeed how the crimes were committed that weren't really public knowledge and could only have been known by someone who was in the Watt house 
and indeed had fired the gun. Manuel told what solicitor, Lawrence Dowdle, that Margaret had been shot twice in the head, a fact that had never been revealed to the media by the police. He clearly wanted the credit for what he had done. He certainly didn't want someone else getting the credit, as if it made him a, a celebrity, a criminal celebrity. It's very odd, very strange, but that's what he did. And later, once Mott was released, we then had the business of Manuel getting in touch with Lawrence Dowdle and saying he wanted to meet Watt. And Dowdle arranged a meeting so that Manuel could tell Watt the story of his alleged contact and how he had murdered his family. So Watt had to sit across the table with a drink in hand with this fella, whom at this time they were certain had committed the murder. It must have been an awful experience. Interviews with Manuel and a search of his parents' home revealed nothing. Watt's testimony wasn't enough, and the police would have to play a waiting game. Manuel was released from prison on the 30th of November 1957 and terror stalked the streets again. It wasn't long before Manuel would destroy the life of another innocent victim, just eight days after he's released. One of the difficulties with every serial killer that we discuss on Murder Casebook is working out how many murders that serial killer might actually be responsible for. In Manuel's case, there is another crime committed when Manuel is in Newcastle. He leaves Barlini prison and is supposedly looking for work in Newcastle. Whilst we know Manuel is in Newcastle, there's the murder of someone called Sidney Dunn, who's a taxi driver. Now, Dunn had picked up a fare to Edmund Byers at Newcastle Station. The police eventually investigate this wrecked taxi. It was an Austin saloon. And they find Dunn's body about 150 yards away. Now, for some reason, they think he's committed suicide. He's not been robbed, he's still got money in his pockets. His throat has been cut. So they regard it as a suicide. It's not clear why. It's only when they actually get the body examined for a post-mortem, they also find he's been shot. Manuel's appetite for death was growing. By 1957, his reign of terror had destroyed the lives of five innocent people. Was there no end to the killing spree? With no apparent motive for the killings, no one knew who was next. I'm Fred Dynage and I'm investigating the horrific murders that took place here in Scotland in the 1950s. By 1957, Peter Manuel had needlessly destroyed the lives of five people. Four women had been murdered in Scotland, each with a sexual element to the killing. The fifth victim was a taxi driver from Newcastle. Manuel thrived on telling tales and injecting himself into the heart of the story. He'd given clues to the police on the Watts family murders, revealing to the father's solicitor precise details of the shooting. But there wasn't enough firm evidence to convict him, and Manuel was free to walk the streets of Glasgow. On the 28th of December, Manuel struck again. This time, the pretty 17-year-old Isabel Cook disappeared. Isabel Cook was uh, still at school at Uddingston Grammar. She was going to go to a dance that particular night. She was going to meet up with her boyfriend, Douglas Bryden, at the bus stop. She never made it to the bus stop. The police had no idea where Isabel Cook was. She had simply vanished off the face of the earth. There were some, some items of clothing, I think, found, uh, and it was clear that she had, you know, encountered uh, a bad time, but nobody knew where she was, and it was assumed that she was dead. Again, there's another 
um, hunt for where Isabel Cook had disappeared to. And over the course of the next 24, 48 hours, increasingly the police and those searching begin to find um, evidence in relation to what had happened to Isabel Cook. Manuel had claimed his sixth victim, but this time he'd covered his tracks and there was no body. Yet again, he'd got away with murder. On the 31st of December, 1957, Glasgow celebrated the new year and the manuals were no exception. Peter met his father and brother in a local pub and the drinks continued back at the family home. At around 4 a.m. in the morning, with everyone asleep, Manuel saw his opportunity and slipped out of the house unnoticed. The Smart family in Uddingston were not to see 1958. New Year's Day, 1958. Manuel gets up early in the morning, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock. He walks 10 minutes, maybe less, to a bungalow owned by a chap called Peter Smart, lived in by his wife and his 11-year-old son, Michael. Manuel breaks in. He shoots all three of them dead, shoots them in the head using a Beretta, small caliber pistol. He steals money that's in Smart's wallet. Now, the important thing is Smart had been paid just after Christmas and had drawn out money in used notes, in sequence, numbered sequence. Manuel seems to have spent a little time in the house. He fed the cat. Now he says there were two tins of kitty cat there and he thought he'd use that, but he saw a tin of salmon. So he thought the cat might as well have the salmon because no one else here is going to be eating it. What was particularly awful about that crime was Manuel went back to the house over several, over several days, it happened around the New Year period, and the Smarts were due to go on holiday. So in that sense, they weren't, they weren't really missed at first. And Manuel went back to the house, was known to eat soup there and feed the cat with uh, body littering the place, so. It, it's quite horrific, quite horrific. Manuel had taken Peter Smart's car and drove it during the days following the murder. Bizarrely, he even gave a lift to an unwitting police officer investigating the case. He's driving Peter Smart's car and he's going to give a lift to one of the police officers who are investigating the murder. And he's going to give advice to the policeman about where the policeman should be turning his attention. Of course, the other thing about the Smarts murder is that this is actually going to produce the evidence that's going to bring Manuel's killing spree to an end. The bodies of the Smart family weren't discovered until the 6th of January. With a killer causing terror and fear in the area, the Lanarkshire police called in detectives from Glasgow. One person who remembers the impact of the family's murder was David Pirrett, playmate of the 11-year-old Michael Smart. Well, Michael was uh, simply my best friend at the time. He was uh, interested in the things that I was interested in, the pre-electronic age. There were woods very close to his house, and we used to go into the woods and wade in the, in the stream, or the burn, as we would call it. We would even pretend to hunt rabbits, we'd make bows and arrows, and. Uh, and walk for miles in the country. And, and if the weather was really bad, we would play with dinky toys or train sets. He, he was just my pal. I can't really go any further than that. And on the day of the murder, you'd played together, and I believe you'd been invited round for a, what they would call today a sleepover. That's right. Well, I'm not sure if anybody knew exactly when they were murdered. Um, I think it was between the end of the year and the 6th of January of 1958. And I do remember playing with them one day. His mother asked me to stay the night, or he did. And I remember phoning my mother and she said, you can't because you've got something on the next day. It wasn't convenient. You've got to remember I was only 11 years of age. I was obviously devastated by it. But then 
there was a sort of climate of fear running around the area at the time because there had been other murders. There'd been murders in uh, East Kilbride, which was maybe, what, six miles away. There'd just been the murder of Isabel Cook, which had taken place the month before. So there was a general feeling of fear in the community. I can remember my father going out to buy extra locks for the windows and people were doing that sort of thing because of the general climate of fear and, and obviously after this murder it was even worse. What effect did all this have on, on the people of Glasgow? Did it cause? Well, it was particularly bad, I think, in the Lanarkshire area near. I mean, the, it was a fairly narrow radius. You had the Watts, then you had Isabel Cook, then you had the Smart family, you see. And you've got to think what it must have been like in that area where not only were young women being murdered, but families were being murdered in their bed asleep by a burglar with a gun. Uh, I mean, burglary is bad enough, but my goodness me, when that was happening, and there's no doubt that a lot of people worried themselves sick over it, and the police were under tremendous pressure. The police were circling closer and closer. Interviews for information on the Smarts murders always led to the same source, Manuel. And with his previous criminal history, his involvement looked more certain. The case against Manuel builds, but the police still need evidence. By the 12th of January, his house was under surveillance. During this time, the police traced the brand new banknotes stolen from the Smart robbery to the local pubs. The Smarts were going to go on holiday, and so Mr. Smart had withdrawn money from his bank account, and that money that he had withdrawn was in crisp new banknotes. And those new banknotes were going to start turning up in various pubs and clubs in the Gorbals area of Glasgow, and quite clearly the person who was handing those, uh, those notes over to pay for his drinks was none other than Peter Manuel. A pattern was emerging and the police had only one name in mind, Peter Manuel. The west of Scotland fell into a panic. The killer of the Watts family and the Smart family was still on the loose. The nation was gripped in fear. Who would be the next victim? There's a lot of local intelligence from the Glasgow underworld that Manuel may be responsible. And remember, Manuel's a fantasist. Manuel likes to create this impression of himself as a super gangster, as a safe blower, as a killer. And he, you know, he idolizes people like Al Capone and Babyface Nelson. And of course, he's a braggart, and he's gonna be talking about these kinds of things in the local underworld, in the clubs and pubs of Glasgow. Manuel's constant boasting and storytelling had antagonized Glasgow kingpin Samuel Dandy Mackay. The view from the Glasgow underworld was that he had to go. Remember, somebody who was as talkative, someone who was such a fantasist, was of no use to the Glasgow underworld because he was constantly going to draw attention to himself. In fact, a London gangster, Mad Frankie Fraser, actually said that he would never have used uh, Peter Manuel because, quote, he couldn't keep his yap shut. In other words, he was too eager to talk, to inject himself into the story, to make something more of himself than he actually was. On the 14th of January, 1958, the police raided the Manuel home in Birkinshaw in the search for stolen goods from the Smart family home. Manuel was arrested. It was the last time he would ever see his home. I'm Fred Dynage, and I'm re-examining the shocking events that led to the capture of Peter Manuel and the end of his reign of terror over Scotland. Manuel had committed nine ruthless murders with no motive. Eight in Scotland, one in the north of England. The police had arrested him for theft and burglary, but how were they going to convict him of the killings? Alec Brown was put in charge with a unit of cops from, from Glasgow and some from Hamilton, but Brown was in charge. 
almost the first thing he did was arrest Manuel. He brought him in on housebreaking charges. The point was they got him off the street. That was what clearly Brown's intention was. And they then built the case, the wider, more serious case, from that. Manuel's father had also been arrested for theft. He claimed some of the stolen items were his in an attempt to save his son. Knowing Manuel's love of attention, the police leave him on his own in a cell for almost 24 hours. But he does actually begin to say, look, I'm worried about my family, I'm worried about my father. If you bring them here, I'll tell you about various crimes I've been involved in. He eventually writes three confessions, each one more detailed than the rest. The final one is written after he's seen his parents, and he does say to them, look, I don't know what makes me do these things. I've been involved in murders. Manuel had admitted to the murders of Anne Nealans, Isabel Cook, the Watt family, and the Smarts, all of the eight Scottish killings. He confessed to see his parents. I do think he had a good relationship with his parents. His parents have historically provided Manuel with an alibi at crucial moments in his criminal career. So there could be some element of love. And remember later, his parents are going to say that Manuel was always really well behaved when he was at home. But I think there's a second more psychological reason, and that is serial killers, murderers like Manuel, love injecting themselves into the heart of the story. Manuel agreed to show the police where he would buried the body of 17-year-old Isabel Cook whilst giving his confession. And this is during the daytime he makes this promise. He says, no, no, I don't want to do it in the daytime. I murdered her at night and I can only find my way to her grave during the dark. He's released, especially under police escort, and on the way he shows them where he'd hidden various bits of her property. It's reported that when he gets to the field where she's buried, he tells them, oh, be careful, I started digging a grave there, but someone disturbed me, so don't fall into that pit. And then he goes further into the field and says, yeah, it's about here. I think I'm standing on her. Peter Manuel's trial began on the 12th of May, 1958. The queue for the public gallery snaked around Glasgow High Court. Hundreds had gathered to witness the trial of the century, and they weren't to be disappointed. Manuel sacked his lawyers and conducted his own defence. Was he mad? No. He was the centre of attention. Manuel pleaded not guilty to the eight Scottish murders he was tried for. Even though he confessed to the murders and shown the police where the body of Isabel Cook lay. The atmosphere when Manuel is taken to court is absolutely electric. It is the hottest ticket in town. It's that kind of that frisson, that glamour of the dark side, that dark tourism that's going to attract everyday members of the public to a particular set of circumstances around the dreadful murder and around the, the character of the murderer himself. Manuel had glamorized the image of a serial killer with his American accent and clean cut image. One man who saw Manuel in court firsthand was former criminal defense lawyer, Joe Beltrami. So Joe, describe Manuel to me, if he, if he was sat here now, describe. Very smartly turned out, immaculate one would say, uh, shoes highly polished, good suit, hair well combed, and uh, very clean. What was his demeanour in court? Perfectly subservient. Didn't cause any scenes. No shouting or bawling. Quiet throughout the proceedings. What's strange about Manuel, in one of the court appearances, we sort of bumped against each other, and uh, he was very small. I mean, the impression everyone gives of Manuel as a tall, powerfully built guy. He was about, he was lucky if he was five foot five. I mean, he just bounced off me. And I was surprised at how small he was, in fact. Typical small man trying to think big. 
Manuel's previous convictions and time spent in court had taught him about the Scottish legal system. Manuel is somebody who feels that he's got the gift of the gap. He believes he's clever enough to fool everybody. So when he's defending himself, for example, he puts one of the police officers in the witness box and for 60, 80 minutes, he bombards that police officer with hundreds of questions. He really does think he can trick the jury into believing that he, in fact, is innocent. And on occasions when I was in listening to him, he was cross-examining witnesses and, in my opinion, betraying too much knowledge to be an outsider. In other words, he was, he was betraying the fact that he knew a lot more about it than he was saying in the witness box. Hard to avoid that if you're defending yourself. You're putting yourself in the position of the witness. The youngest witness to give evidence against Manuel was David Pirrett, best friend of 11-year-old Michael Smart. Because I was only 11 and didn't know what to expect, um, I found it more of an adventure, I think, than anything else. Um, I have a vivid memory of going into the High Court, which was in blazing light, packed with people. The wood of the benches, the advocates or barristers, as you might call them, wearing their wigs with their gowns, and a judge sitting up there with a wig on and a, and a cloak, which I think from memory would be silver with red crosses on it. It was a, a sight that I, as an 11-year-old, had never seen before. Do you remember the evidence that you gave? My evidence was to the effect that I had last seen Michael on the day I saw him, and I'd gone back to the house on a subsequent day, and I'd gone to the house, say, in the morning, and I'd rung the doorbell, and there was no reply. And I'd noticed that the curtains were closed in the lounge. I went back in the afternoon, rang the doorbell, and there was no reply, but I noticed that the curtains in the lounge were open. So the assumption is that uh, Manuel could have been in the house when I went to the first time and rang the doorbell. On day 13, Manuel entered the witness box to give evidence on his own behalf and spoke without notes for 88 minutes. This continued the next day for 152 minutes. Manuel was talking for his life, even though this time it was unlikely to save him. But during the summing up, the judge made a surprise ruling for the jury to find Manuel not guilty of the killing of Anne Neelands. On the 29th of May, the jury took just two hours and 22 minutes to find Manuel guilty on all seven charges of murder. His execution date was set for the 19th of June. When Manuel is found guilty, he again therefore thinks he can escape the rope. So what he tries to do thereafter is he tries to convince a number of people who are going to examine him that he, he in fact is mentally ill. So much so that he foams at the mouth. And of course this is merely a ruse uh, that he's dreamed up to try and avoid being hanged. Manuel remains incoherent for 18 days, saying only six or seven words to the prison wardens. A completely different man to the talkative, arrogant killer who'd entered the courtroom. His family go to see him, and he doesn't recognize them. He doesn't speak to them. He won't say anything. His mother pulls his hair and says, you know, you're not fooling me, Peter. But it goes on. When he comes out of it, he says, where am I? What date is it? You know, where have I been? He claims he was hit on the head by one of the warders. And, you know, he's out of it because of that. They don't accept that. So he's hanged. At 8 a.m. on the 11th of July, 1958, Peter Anthony Manuel was hanged at Barlini Prison. His reign of terror had filled newspaper headlines. His trial attracted worldwide interest. His death brought relief to the streets of Glasgow. Manuel's unusual criminologically because he's one of the few Scottish serial killers who've murdered 
not in England or elsewhere, but murdered in Scotland. And of course, one of the reasons why he loved doing that was he could read the newspapers, he could hear himself on the radio, he could be, as it were, centre stage. Most murderers have one thing in common, motive, a reason to kill. And this is where Peter Manuel chillingly stands out, because he appeared to kill totally at random, without any real reason, simply because he felt like it. And that, to me, defies belief. His terrifying actions frightened an entire country. And it's now clear to me why in Scotland, Peter Manuel was thought of as the devil incarnate.